All right, good morning, everyone. Um, once again, if you haven't already and you're interested, um, this is our iClicker code, assuming that's legible for you, NU7QF. Um, yeah, if you download the app or have a clicker, that's our code. I will not be grading or ever even looking at the results of the iClicker polls after classes. They're really just a check-in to see um, how people are getting the material as the lecture goes on um, and a great way to practice. So I highly encourage you to participate um, and at the very least like answer the questions to yourself in a notebook, um, but I will not keep track. Um, along with that, lecture attendance is not kept track of in any way. It's highly encouraged and an important part of the class, um, but it's up to you. I will be posting lecture recordings up of all of these and my ones from last qu or spring quarter um, are on my YouTube channel as well. They'll be super similar um, this year and last year, um, so you can always take a look at either or both. Um, and I'll try to get them up same day, but it doesn't always happen. Um, but usually within 24 hours of the lecture, I'll be able to put the recording up. Um, and I didn't this time, but I'll try to make the slides available um, sometime the day before as well if you want to download them and follow along there. Um, so you're obviously the B section. This is the one that will be recorded as well. Um, and I <laughs> didn't think there was going to be that big of a difference, but already on the first day, it will be pretty drastic if you're watching along now. Um, I dismissed the A lecture at, by accident at 8.30 instead of 8.50. <laughs> so I crazy rushed through the last 10 minutes, and then a few people stuck around and said, you have 20 minutes left. So I'm very confident I can get through our material in the time allotted for us. Um, and I will take my time a little bit more. Um, about me, I'm a fifth year grad student in astronomy. I've taught the seven series a lot. This is my second time lecturing. Um, and yeah, so I'm excited to do that, but still very much learning and developing the way I do it. So I'm very open to and would appreciate your feedback um, at any point in the quarter. It can be little things like I can't read the font in your slides um, or just like overall class structure, um, anything you want to let me know about. I'm open to hear it and without penalty. So I, I encourage it to be critical if it needs to be. Um, I want to tune the class to, to work best for everyone. Um, my research deals with gravitational lensing and dark matter. It's a little schematic of kind of what I do. But I won't talk about it much right now. Um, I have two cats and I like running. And uh, yeah, that's me. So course info, um, you should all have access to the Canvas by now. If you're like not officially in the course or don't have it yet or anything, um, send me or your TA an email and we will add you on to that. Um, the full syllabus, calendar, and TA information are up. Um, you can all, office hours will be up soon enough. I just want to have the first DL before we make TAs decide their office hours so they can get some feedback from you about when you would prefer them. Um, my office hours I'm planning on having on Thursdays, which are the day before lecture, and so the day before quizzes. Um, this time and date are most likely, but TBD, I might change the room or something like that. Um, so double check before you come to one. Um, again, all that posted soon. So communication for the course, we'll use Piazza and Discord um, for most stuff. Uh, I don't know. There might be a Discord already created. Maybe some of you are part of it. I don't have the link yet, but if someone shares it to me, I will post the link on the Canvas or somewhere um, for people to be able to access. Um, Piazza is the main place that us as like instructors and TAs will be looking to answer course questions. Highly encourage you to use Piazza instead of email so everyone can see your questions, whether they're logistics or course content related. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a question with the size of this course, which is over 300, there's definitely someone else that has the same one. Um, it's also a great way to earn a little bit of extra participation, um, points that could contribute to higher mid-pass. Um, if you're very active on Piazza, we do notice that, and that's not only asking questions, but answering them um, from other people too. It doesn't need to be some super polished, perfect answer. Um, it's a collaborative space, so feel free to weigh in on stuff. Um, it's a great place to learn. And of course, Discord is a great place too for like more informal um, learning with other students. And there is a separate channel on there with um, guided 7B help um, from people outside of the course um, that have nothing to do with 
like TA, like that have nothing to do with your grade, basically. So a true separate uh, like venue for you to uh, learn. Whether or not the Discord is monitored, not mon monitored, but like ans questions are answered and stuff by TAs, um, kind of varies semester by semester. I'll certainly let the TAs know about it. Um, sometimes you get someone that's very active, but Piazza, I promise you, will be answered. Um, and in general, generally we, we do answer them pretty quickly within like an hour or two. Um, so yeah. Um, and of course, Canvas and email, uh, like direct message always exists, so feel free to use them. Yeah. Question? No, it's definitely not required. If you were, you know, very active in DL and, uh, yeah, your TA feels you deserve it, it's not at all. It's just another way that you can participate. Um, yeah. Any questions about this type of logistics stuff? Oh, the most, it's not most important. And important thing on this slide, quizzes. We'll have five of them. The dates are already listed on the calendar on Canvas. Your first one is two weeks from today. So not next week, but the week after. They take 20 minutes. For you, they'll be at the very beginning of lecture. So even if you're not attending the lecture part of it, you need to be here at nine. The quizzes are mandatory. There's no makeups, um, but I will drop the lowest grade. So whether that's just your poorest performance or if you have to miss one for illness or travel, anything, um, we'll just, we're gonna drop your lowest grade. Um, yeah, any other concerns about that, reach out to me individually, but hopefully you should be able to make at least four of them. Um, the grading is broken down in the syllabus, but quizzes are roughly half, and your final exam is roughly half with a few percent for um, DL participation, which assuming you just submit your FNTs on time and complete um, with any degree of effort, it's pretty easy to get 100% for the participation. Um, yeah, and then the opportunity for high pass or mid pass if you are, uh, if you go above and beyond in your participation um, in DL. And it's not just about answering questions. I think the most important thing, and that will I, I will encourage TAs to look for, are your participation within your group. So making sure that when you move on, everyone else is caught up, that people are on the same page. It's not your responsibility to teach the course, but these groups are collaborative, um, and that's what will be rewarded. Um, course content, there is a textbook. Um, there are some reading assignments that someone has made up. I didn't put those together, the specific reading assignments, so they don't necessarily align to the lectures or DLs perfectly, um, but they, it's a great resource to review occasionally if you want to just go back to the basics and hear the general things explained in a different way, or also sometimes see specific examples that go into a lot of detail, probably more than you need, but again, it's just good to round out your understanding. Um, but you could very well go through the whole quarter without looking at the textbook. Um, the materials that we provide you with from DLs and lectures um, will be where your assessment material comes from. The textbook is just kind of supplementary. Um, lecture videos also from other quarters exist. So like I said, I have, I will upload my own lectures and there are some from past my past quarter, uh, but there's also other lecturers, other 7B content, a ton of stuff out there and I highly encourage that you take a look if you just want different ways of hearing stuff. Um, hopefully most of you are familiar with the way the 7 series works um, from 7A, but just in general, um, a little prep before lecture and a cer certainly DL does help a lot and just like having the concept stick a little bit better. Um, but lecture is going to be more of an overview of content. I'll definitely do some examples and do some types of detailed work. Um, but in general, it is, yeah, to introduce you to stuff. You will see new content in DL. So not everything uh, that you're responsible for will come up in lecture. Um, we're aware of that. That's, yeah, DLs are just kind of the practice and getting to know um, the material. Your TA will be able to walk through stuff. And some stuff, like the DLs, are, are meant to kind of have you discover certain things as you walk through. Sometimes that can be a very cool process. Sometimes it can be a little painful. Um, but we'll figure it out, and I'm always willing to fill in things in lecture um, that you feel like we need some more practice with. So don't be afraid to request on Piazza or by email or stuff specific things um, that you want to see. Um, that's also a great use of office hours. Um, right, yeah, FNTs are going, except for the first DL, do every DL thereafter. 
Um, they are your homework for this course, but they're not graded for correctness, just completion, and a little bit of effort. Um, consistency is the key with those. I don't stress yourself out about putting in a huge amount of time for them every single week. They just, again, some amount of effort. I would rather you spend some amount of time with them every single week than do it in crazy detail some weeks and miss it others. It just makes DL work so much better if you have attempted the FNT beforehand. It's really for you, because if you go into a DL without the FNT, not only is the first part of the DL almost always going over it, um, it's just really hard to catch up with the concepts, because the DL assumes that you have kind of toyed around with those things on your own a little bit. Um, that's also where you'll get great practice with things that are important for quizzes, like unit conversion and just how, like you know algebraic, algebraic stuff that you might be a little rusty on. Um, even if it makes sense when someone's presenting it, if you don't do a couple examples for, your, uh, for yourself, it's very hard to pull that together in a 20 minute quiz. Um, yeah, for quizzes, I'll provide you practice problems. There's a lot of practice quizzes um, every single time, so don't feel like you have to do all of them. Um, but yeah, there should be plenty of practice. I'll try to upload that type of stuff at least a week in advance of each quiz, yeah. No, the FNTs, because you go over them in DL, it's kind of like you should, by the end of DL, know all the right answers um, to those questions. Um, okay, so the material, we're gonna start out with steady state energy density systems, the steady state energy density model um, with fluids and electric circuits. Um, then we'll talk about it more generally as linear transport, which is just kind of the a model that describes flow of energy density in general. Um, then we'll look at what happens if these systems are not steady state, so not constant in time. Um, exponential change gets a little math heavy, um, but no calculus is required to do it. Um, from there, if you feel like you are struggling or falling behind or just bored of this material, great, because we take a very hard pivot to vectors, which are super different from what we do in the first part of the quarter. Um, yeah, the second half of the quarter looks a lot more like a traditional physics class that you would expect as an introduction where we talk about forces, momentum, Newton's laws, stuff like that. Um, yeah, no, normally you'd expect to see that earlier in a physics curriculum, but for the seven series, you don't see it till halfway through the second quarter. But uh, I think it works well. Um, so yeah, anyway, if you're feeling a little bit lost by the first few weeks, um, know that we are going to change things up a lot, and it's a great opportunity to reset. All right, so let's get into today. Um, we're gonna talk about fluid flow. First, we'll talk about conservation of energy density and current and what those two things are, um, and then we'll apply those things to fluid energy density systems, or like fluid circuits, um, and we'll call that the Bernoulli's equation. So Bernoulli's equation is kind of the golden equation that we, you'll be using for the next couple weeks. Um, and so that's our goal today, is to put it together, assemble it. Um, and then from there in DL and next lecture, we'll work on putting it to use in a broader context. Okay, in 7A you talked a lot about energy. You can learn there's a bunch of different energy systems that it can manifest as. You have potential energy, kinetic energy, thermal energy, et cetera. Um, and you just talked about it as well, an amount of energy in a system. So these are two systems, we have one a cubic centimeter and a cubic meter. The set cubic centimeter, I'll say, has one joule in it. This cubic meter, maybe a million, whatever. That's the way that we would describe energy in systems in 7A. But now we're pivoting to talk about energy density. So same system here, except now we're talking about energy density or energy per unit volume. So the way I would describe these two systems here is this one centimeter cube has an energy density of, well, one joule per cubic centimeter. And now for the larger system, this cubic meter has an energy density of a million joules per cubic meter. But that, if you do the unit conversion, is equal to one joule per cubic meter. So in the energy way of thinking about things, these two systems are very different. One is a million times as big. But when we look at energy density, these two look very much alike. They both have the same amount of energy per unit volume. It's not as relevant that this one is a lot bigger. Um, so we'll talk about why that helps 
in a little bit. Um, the other key, so we have energy density and then conservation um, of both energy density and current. So let's talk about, we just introduced energy density. What do we mean by conservation of it? It means as fluid flows, so in this case, just imagine we have a pipe with fluid flowing through it from left to right. 10 joules per meter cubed is the energy density here. So for every meter cubed of fluid, we have 10 joules contained within it. That's flowing through. And if that's what comes in, same thing must come out. Right? Between point A and point B, we have conservation of energy density. The same thing goes for conservation of current. I'll define current more carefully in a sec, but right now we'll just think about like the flow of stuff. Let's say we have two molecules flowing in, we have to have two molecules flowing out. That's just what we mean by conservation throughout a fluid system. The important questions are for conservation, where and when is it conserved? Like when we just say in and out of where, you know. So um, we're also changing what we consider for our where and when. And 7A, we were consider considering for the most part our when. So it's a change, in a, like a change is a change in time. So point A is a point in time, and point B is a point in time sometime later than that. So if we're talking about conservation of energy, in 7A we have 10 joules, after some amount of time still have 10 joules, energy is conserved. Now, we're not only talking about energy density, we're talking about energy density changing in space. So from point A over here to point B over here. We don't care about the change in time anymore because we're going to assume that the behavior of systems is independent of time. Another word for that is steady state. So that's a big key word that you'll hear over the next few weeks, steady state, and it means that it's constant in time. The behavior of the system is unchanging. So our 7A way of thinking of things as what's the difference between the, the system at point A in time and point B is pretty boring because it doesn't change. Our changes in time are zero. However, as we move physically throughout a fluid circuit, what's the energy density at this point, this point, this point, um, those, that's what we're, what we're concerned with because a circuit can have uh, different energy density systems change in value all throughout it. But those changes are constant in time. We'll be, I'll give examples of that in a sec. Um, but yeah, to sum it up now, we have our flow of energy density, our flow of uh, fluid or you know, matter, uh, and that is constant in time. So why? Um, why energy density and not energy? Well, like I said, we're concerned about like the behavior of a system. We wanna know how fluid circuits are working and what's happening within them, and Let's take a look at this very simple example. We just have two pipes with water flowing through them, except one's a little bit longer than the other. Probably wanna describe those two things the same way because the behavior of the fluid flowing through them will be the same, right? Like it, if the same amount of water is flowing through at the same rate with the same pressure, all these different things what we'll define soon, um, we don't really care that this one's longer. If we were concerned with the total energy then this one on the bottom would have more energy contained within it. It's a longer pipe, it contains more fluid with m like more energy, like it all has the same energy density. So if we have more volume of it, we have more energy, but we don't care about that. But these two would be described the same using energy density to talk about things because we only care about, again, energy per unit volume. So the total volume is irrelevant. So that's why we use energy density. And then for changes in position, well, I already said because there is no change in time. For now, we're looking at steady state systems um, where change from point A to point B in time will be zero. Um, okay, so what is current? Current, flow rate, um, both of those things are synonymous and it means the amount of fluid per time. So just how much fluid is flowing through our circuit per unit time. Um, yeah, so current and flow rate will be tossed around. Both of those words mean the same thing. Um, current is simpler, flow rate is a little more like dem demonstrative of like what you're talking about. It's the rate of flow. Um, so we can think about it as molecules. It's like two molecules per second flowing through A, two molecules per second flowing out of B. Um, so that's one way to think about it. We don't normally count fluid molecules though. We normally think about current of fluid as volume, right? We think about milliliters, liters, whatever, cubic centimeters. Um, 
So our units of current here are going to be volume per time. How much volume of fluid is flowing through each point in the circuit per unit time? Um, and I say point, I just have like a vague A and B over here. The way I like to think about it as like through gates, like each cross section is like a, is like a gate. Like how much fluid is flowing through that cross section or gate per unit time? How much fluid is flowing through B? Um, yeah, so I, current, that's the symbol for it, is volume per unit time. Steady state current means that that does not change, yeah. Good question. We don't care about necessarily, because that's not a point in time, that it's like a, it's a rate. So like if we think about velocity or speed or something like that, say I'm moving at five meters per second, I don't care, and I just say, like I just say, I'm always moving at five meters per second. You, you don't necessarily care whether that is at three seconds in time forward from now or 10 seconds ago or whatever, it's just a unit to describe the rate. So that just means like if I, was standing here with a stop, if I could somehow count volume and I was standing here with a stopwatch and clocked one second and watched all the fluid flow through this gate, then the amount that flowed through would be one meter cubed. If it was two seconds, two meter cubed. So it, I guess time is kind of important in that there is flow. So the system is kind of, like there, there is movement in the system, fluid is flowing through it, but it's not dynamic in time and that the behavior is the same. So a snapshot here looks the same as a snapshot here, so on and so forth. Okay, so how do we calculate current? We said it's a volume per unit time. Yeah. Over time, I would say systems go to different places in the phase diagram. That would be a change in time, because you're saying like at time zero, it's all frozen. At time two, half of it's frozen, half of it's liquid. At time three, it's all melted, something like that. And our, the spatial element just stays the same. We just think of like the average through the box. Whereas in this case, when we're thinking about fluid flow through a circuit, again, yeah, the behavior is the same. We're just saying like, what is the speed of the flow here versus here? So we're looking at that change in position. That change is going to be constant through time, but it's you know, there is some change between this point and this point in space. So yeah, th th this will hopefully make a little more sense when we start doing examples with changes in between them. Um, first, yeah, let's go back to current. So current is our flow rate, it's our volume per unit time of fluid that's flowing through a certain point. Um, so how do we calculate it? This little derivation, you're not responsible for reproducing, just to kind of show you where it comes from. Um, so we said volume per unit time. Well, how do we calculate the volume of a section of like the fluid in a section of pipe? So let's calculate the volume of this highlighted section of pipe to the right here. Um, its length we can describe um, by the flow rate times the amount of time it takes to flow through it. So the flow, or sorry, not the flow rate, the speed of the flow. So how many meters per second is does each water molecule have? Like how fast is it moving through? If you multiply a rate times a time, we get a distance, right? So this S1, this length of this section, is just however far a molecule can travel in a given an amount of time. And then to get the volume from the, we have the length, so we just need the area. So we multiply the volume, or sorry, multiply the length by the area, and we'll get the volume of that cylinder of the pipe. So if we multiply S1, V1 times delta T, by A1, the area, we'll get the volume of that cylinder. So now we have the volume of fluid in this section, and that's equal to V1 times delta T times A1, so the speed of the flow, times the change in time, times the area, 
and then we want the volume per unit time, so we just take that volume and divide by unit time, the delta T cancels out, so maybe this helps solidify that of like why the, we're still talking about time but it's not important. This delta T is going to cancel out. When we divide the volume, which is V delta T A, and then divide by delta T, it cancels. So current only depends on the area of the pipe, the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and the speed of the fluid flow through it. It doesn't depend on time at all. So let's just examine this a little bit. The key takeaway here is that I, current, is equal to AV, or area times speed of the fluid flow. So let's say we have two pipes. They both have fluid flowing through them with the same speed, but one is twice the cross-sectional area of the other. One is just a bigger pipe. Well, that pipe's gonna have a higher flow rate. More volume of fluid is going to flow through it per unit time than the smaller one. Because they're all moving, all the water is moving at the same speed, but there's just twice as much in any given cross-section as another. Um, take another two pipes. Now they have the same area, cross-sectional area, so the same size pipes, except the water in one is flowing twice as fast as the one in the other. Well, it's gonna have twice the current because twice the amount of water is flowing through any given point at any given time. So increasing area or increasing speed of the fluid both increase our current. So we said current is conserved. Well, within a steady state system, um, what does that mean? Well, it just means that whatever my current is at one point, that is the current at every other point as well. The reason being is just, well, if they weren't equal, that would mean I have more coming in than is coming out, or more coming out than was coming in. It, I would either need the pipe to leak, or I would need to be adding more water somewhere. I can't produce more fluid or get rid of it. So if I have one meter per second, or one meter cube per second flowing through here, all of that is going to go up to the next section of pipe. There's nowhere else for it to go. So our flow rate, our current, has to be conserved. And what that means is that I1 equals I2 at any point in the circuit. So if I take two points, my current at one is going to be the same as my current at the other. Do you have a question? Yeah, great question. So that kind of is where I was going with this. If you see the title, we say current is conserved within a single steady state fluid system. You could also reverse that and say a steady state fluid system is one in which current is conserved. So a single, that's kind of how we define a steady state system and, and define uh, current conservation, is if I tell you this is a steady state fluid system, or if you can figure that out, then you know that the current has to be the same everywhere. But if you have proof like, oh, the current here is not equal to the current at this point, you know that they must not be part of the same fluid system. Maybe there was a branch somewhere that let some water out, or I don't know, maybe they're just not connected at all. Um, but yeah, so th those two things go back and forth. Steady state fluid system means current is conserved. Conserved current means you have one single steady state fluid system. So like I said, I1 at any point is equal to I2 at any other point. And the takeaway here is that my AV, the cross-sectional area times the velocity or the speed of the fluid multiplied together at one point is the same as that product at any other. So if we take a look at the pipe above here, the speed has to change from one to the other because the area changes, right? We know the current does not change. The current in this left section is the same as the current in the right section. But the right section has a larger cross-sectional area. So if the product AV has to be the same, if A2 is greater, V2 has to be smaller in order for those two things to even out. We can think of that intuitively, like if we think about, like the, the water just has more space to spread out so it doesn't have to hustle as much, right? We need the same amount of water to pass through each gate per unit time. If there's a very narrow pipe, it's gonna have to rush through to get the same amount through in a unit time as it will, as like rush through compared to if the pipe was really large, then lots of water can pass through simultaneously so it doesn't need to move as fast. So given that the current is conserved, we have this 
inverse relationship between the cross-sectional area of the pipe and the speed. If you shrink the area, the speed has to increase, and if you increase the area, the speed has to decrease to conserve current. Okay, so now we're gonna introduce this idea of pressure. So we have an intuitive understanding, probably, of what pressure is, right? If you think about diving underwater, right, you feel pressure, it like starts to squeeze you. If you inflate a balloon, you know that you increase the pressure inside and that expands the balloon. Um, but what is it? Well, units-wise, it's, it's an energy density. It's energy per unit volume. That is the same as saying a force per unit area. So those two units, like joules per meter cubed and newtons per meter squared, um, energy density and force per unit area, those two things are equivalent. Um, in this class, we're gonna use energy density because that's the way we're going to describe fluid circuits is like energy density being exchanged between different systems and conserved throughout a circuit, and it works much better for us to think about it. However, just as a check, if we think about pressure as force per unit area, that's how we can kind of connect it to our intuitive understanding of pressure, right? You dive underwater, you say like the pressure increases when you're deep underwater, I feel a force on me, right? The force per unit area, how much the water is squeezing into me is increased. Um, if I blow into a balloon, the pressure of the air inside is pushing with some force per unit area out on the balloon. That's why the balloon's getting bigger. That's why it's expanded so much because there's some pressure inside that's pushing out on it. Um, yeah, so intuitively, pressure is force per unit area, but it's also an energy density. Um, and pressure changes to like fulfill conservation of energy density. What do I mean by that? Well, we said energy is conserved, right? It can't be created or destroyed. Let's say like we're talking about a closed steady state fluid system, right? We're not adding, adding any energy, we're not taking any away. And so if I lose potential energy, for instance, or potential energy density, that has to go somewhere else to another energy density system. Just like in 7A, we might have had thermal energy that turns into kinetic or kinetic that turns into potential or something like that, but overall it's conserved. Same deal here, except now um, we have pressure to account for this balance. So the way, this equation down here, which is a piece of the Bernoulli equation that we're working toward, shows the balance between these changing energy density systems. We have our change in potential energy density and change in kinetic energy density. I'll define these a little more carefully in a sec, but for now you can just think of them as the equivalent of, well, I know potential and I know kinetic, so now it's just the density of those energies. Um, and notice there's a delta in front of each one of these terms. So what this equation is saying is not that the pressure plus the potential energy density plus the kinetic energy all have to sum to zero. It's saying that the changes from one point to another in a circuit have to, in a fluid circuit have to sum to zero, right? So if I increase one, another one has to decrease and vice versa. The total has to stay the same or the changes all have to balance out to zero. Potential and kinetic, we'll see, we can just observe how those things change and pressure just kind of fills in the blanks. So that kind of a strange thought, but we'll see how it works in a sec. First, I'll walk you through what these potential, what these energy density systems are, like how we define them. You remember from 7a, potential energy is just mgh, mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. Right? The more mass something has, the more potential energy it has, the higher, the important piece, the higher above the ground. The higher this h, the more potential energy it has. Right? If I let go, it turns into kinetic energy. The higher I let it go from, the faster it will end up falling because it had more stored energy that's transferred to kinetic. Very similar idea, it works the same way, right? If I have a fluid in a pipe that's held at the top and then I let it flow down, gravity's still gonna pull it down. It's kinetic, it's potential energy is gonna turn into kinetic, but now we're gonna think about it as the density of that energy turning in from potential energy density into kinetic energy density or maybe pressure. Um, so the way we do that, just divide by volume. We have potential energy, divide by volume to get the density. Um, 
And if you divide them, if we take that volume on the right hand side and apply it to the mass, mass over volume is just the density of the fluid. So instead of evaluating how much total mass do I have times G times H divided by the volume of that mass, it's easier to just use the density times GH. So that the density is going to be just something you're given. The density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. Density of air is something much smaller than that, whatever. But this is kind of leaning toward the idea that we don't care how big our system is. We just care about its behavior, what fluid is flowing inside. That's enough. Like, what is the density of it? I don't care how much there is. So instead of mass, we swap it out with density. And there we go. There's our potential energy density is rho GH. Um, so our indicator for potential energy density, just like in 7a, is height. We can tell if the height increases, our potential energy goes up. And if our height decreases, our potential energy goes down. Um, so let's take a look at an example. Um, we just have a cup of fluid. This is still a steady, it's a very boring one, but it's still a steady state fluid system because the current, which is zero, is not changing. There's no flow here, but there's no flow anywhere, and it's constant through time. So we can still use our equations here. And I've labeled three points in this cup of water, P1, P2, and P3, and we want to look at the changes in pressure and potential energy density between them all. So I'm about to ask with a clicker question about changes in pressure, but let's first just look at the change in potential energy density so the potential energy density is at these three points. If we compare point three to point one, which one is going to have a higher potential energy density? It's gonna be three because, or sorry, one, <laughs> my bad, because one is higher up. It has a higher height, so there's going to be more potential energy density at point one, less at point three, because it's lower down. If we compare one and two, they're at the same height, so they should have the same potential energy density. And if we compare three and two, same thing. It doesn't matter that they're offset. It just matters that the height is different. Point three is lower, so point three has a lower potential energy density. So now I'll pose a question to you. The first time we're kind of exploring how, this, how pressure comes into play here. We're given this equation that our change in pressure plus our change in potential energy density have to sum to zero. Right, those are the two energy density systems at play here, and energy is conserved on the, like in all, so they have to balance each other out. So if we compare P1 and P2, these two points, how does the pressure differ between P1 and P2? So what is the delta P, or the difference between them, between those two points? Oh, I should probably open the poll. Did I? Yeah. And again, with these, often I'll have to rush them or something if we need to save on time, but they don't matter at all. I don't look at who answers what. I don't even know if I can. Um, but. These are just for practice and for me to get an idea of how the class is doing. Um, so I'm going to stop this one five more seconds. OK, so overall, we did really well. Um, the answer is C, that the pressures are equal. Why? Like we said on the previous slide, P1 and P2 are at the same height, so they have the same potential energy density, and so if delta PE over volume, or rho G delta H is zero, because delta H is zero, then our delta P, our change in pressure, also has to equal zero. So we get P1 equals P2. And I know this is tricky. I think conceptually this one is a bit easier, just because we know, like, two point, like, think if you were scuba diving with someone and you were both at the same depth underwater, you wouldn't expect to experience different pressures just because you're 10 feet to the left of someone. Right? It just matters about your depth. That's all this question is asking. But the trickier part here, the new piece, is just applying this equation, where now we're using our interplay between energy density systems to solve for something that was missing. 
Um, so let's do one together that's a little more in depth. What if we look at the pressure difference between points one and point three? So now there is a change in potential energy density between the two. Three is deeper down, there's a height difference, and so there's a change in potential energy density. Our delta PE over volume is rho G delta H. So another way of writing this equation out, the deltas, if you remember in, I mean, no matter whether you're talking in time or in space, to evaluate a change between two points, like from initial to final, you do final minus initial. So if I want to find the difference between point one and point three, saying P1 is my initial, P3 is my final, then I plug in for delta P, P3 minus P1, or final minus initial pressure. There's my delta P. And then for my delta, uh, for my change in potential energy density, same thing, rho G delta H, my delta H is the same thing, H final minus H initial. Here H final is H3 minus H1, which is higher up. And if we evaluate that equation and just rearrange a little bit, we can solve for the pressure at point three is equal to the pressure at point one plus rho G H, where H is just the height difference between them. In other words, the pressure at three is greater than the pressure at one, right? It's pressure at point one plus what's this correction factor for having dove down a distance H uh, lower in the water. Another way to say this is delta P between one and three or delta P one three. You can write it like this. You can put a little arrow, delta P one, two, three, whatever notation is clearest for you out of any of these equals rho GH. As long as it's clear to you that the pressure at point three is greater than the pressure at point one. And that's a great way to check in these problems too. It can get tougher when the problem's more convoluted, there's more parts to it. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to solve for the pressure between two points and one is deeper than the other, it's, a, you know, it's good to remember that the one that's deeper should have a higher pressure. Um, so you can sometimes check your work with kind of that intuitive side of things. Um, so this is a good example of pressure and potential energy balancing each other out. Potential energy has this indicator, height, that we can observe and say, oh, that means the potential energy is higher or lower. And then whatever that change is, pressure takes care of the difference to get us back to zero, to get our deltas back to zero. So what that means is that the energy density throughout this whole cup of water is the same. It's just at the top, the water has more potential energy density and less pressure. And as we go down, it kind of exchanges for, more, for less and less potential energy density and more and more pressure. But the total energy density is the same everywhere in the fluid circuit. And that's what we mean by conservation of energy density. OK. Um, so like I just said, potential energy has this easy indicator, height. right? Higher up, more potential energy density. Lower down, less. Easy. Pressure doesn't really have the same thing. The way we think of it intuitively is like how much is it squeezing or how much is it pushing on the outside of the pipe, right? But we can't really, unless we have some fancy pipe, we can't tell how much the water or fluid, whatever, is pushing on the edge of a pipe. So we need to use something as like a stand-in for a pressure gauge. Like what if I just want to measure the pressure? Well, I can take advantage of this like interchange between potential energy and pressure using a standpipe system. So I'll walk it through in a sec, but what we're basically going to do is we saw that potential energy and pressure will you know, exchange depending on how high up you are. And so if we just have a system with some amount of pressure and we poke a hole in it and put a pipe coming out of it, like, I, like is shown here, we can look at how high the water rises in order to equilibrate with the atmosphere and see what the pressure inside was. So let's walk through that um, with our Bernoulli equation. Um, so first off, first off, it's important to note the atmosphere, the air around us, has some pressure. right? There's one ATM. We don't really experience it as pressure because we're just used to it. But there is some ambient pressure. The air is pushing on us. right? And just like in this fluid system here, the air is pushing down on the water at the top of this column. So it's open to the air. Um, and so where they meet, 
they share a pressure. So the air has atmospheric pressure, so that tells us that at the point that they meet, at the top of this fluid column, they are both at the same pressure. If the water had a higher pressure than the air, then it'd have more force per unit area, it'd keep rising. If the air had more pressure than the water, then the water level would lower. So the fact that they're in equilibrium, that that water level is static, tells us that the pressures are the same. So now we know what the pressure is at the top of this standpipe. Yep. Good question, so I'll, I'll address that in a sec. Um, the short answer is no, but we'll talk about why in a sec. So now we know the pressure at the top is the atmospheric pressure. That's a number we know, it's, I don't know, one ATM is a unit we use, also pascals, which are the, the metric way of describing pressure. It's just, it's about 100,000 pascals to an ATM. Those types of details, you don't need to memorize those, like unit conversions and stuff um, will be given to you, but it's good to practice using them on FNTs and stuff. Anyway. Now that we have the pressure at the top, we know how to find the difference in pressure now due to a change in height, due to a change of potential energy density. So we can use that equation, our change in pressure plus our change in potential energy density equals zero. Our change in pressure is going to be final minus initial, so let's say we wanna dive down to P1, starting at PATM, so the, the top of the water level. So the delta here, is from this point labeled PATM to point P1, where it meets the pipe down below. And so our, that's our change in pressure. We don't know what P1 is. That's what we wanna know. What is the pressure in the pipe? We're trying to use this as a pressure gauge. And the change in potential energy density is then just gonna be rho G H, or delta H. In this case, it's my final is going to be P1, so, and my initial is going to be H at the top of the fluid column. And so that lets us solve that the pressure at point one is equal to atmospheric pressure plus rho GH. Same thing as, well, pretty similar to before, where we just have some pressure that's underwater, or under some fluid, is higher than it was at the surface, right? We dove down that tube, and now our pressure is higher. Why did we do that? Well, now we found the pressure at point one. Just from knowing the height of the fluid in that column, we were able to tell what the pressure in this pipe down below was. That was our original goal, right? We have fluid flowing through it. How do we measure its pressure? What we did was we poked a hole. So now since there's pressure, the water's pressurized, it's gonna spray out. But instead of letting it spray, we just attach a pipe, see how high the water level rises. And that height is indicative of what the pressure is. The higher the pressure, we can see from our equation, the higher the pressure, the higher the height, right? The higher the height in the column gives us a higher pressure, which is intuitive, right? If you have a very pressurized pipe and you put a standpipe coming out of the top, the water's gonna flow out really high to the top of it. And if there's barely any water pressure in the pipe, it might just dribble up a centimeter or so. Um, so there's some key things here that we haven't talked about yet. One is there's multiple fluid systems here. So, so far we've just been talking about like one single steady state energy density system. Flow rate is constant everywhere. That's clearly not the case here because we have fluid flowing through this bottom pipe, but then just a stationary column of water at the top. When I first poke the hole and put the pipe on the top, yes, the water will be rising. That'll be dynamic, but we can look at that later on in the quarter. Right now, we just care about when things are in equilibrium. So once the water has come to its equilibrium state because of the atmospheric pressure, Right? Otherwise, it would just keep rising and rising, but because the air is pushing back down on it, it's gonna stop somewhere. Now we just have this static column of water sitting on top of the pipe. And so those are definitely separate fluid systems because they have different currents. Here I have some current, some flow rate, that's, I don't know, whatever it is, some amount of water flowing through per second, and up there it's zero. We also have a third fluid system you can consider the air. Right? The air is in contact with the standpipe column, the standpipe column is in contact with the pipe below. And we just kind of use it as a way to see the difference in pressure between the air around it and the pipe. So this goes to answering your question, is does this interrupt the flow? Not once it comes to equilibrium, because now the pressure here is being, well, it is in equilibrium. We have this column of water 
that's pushing down on the water in the pipe just as hard as the rest of the edges of this pipe are. So at first, when we first poke the hole, water's going to flow up and up, and it's going to win. It's going to have a higher pressure than the air. But then once the water level gets high enough, the pressures here will be equal. And so this point will be like happy. The pressure from the fluid column above it and the pressure from the pipe below it are the same. And so there will be no, no more flow once the standpipe comes to equilibrium. Um, and so it won't interrupt the flow at all. Um, so a lot of concepts here. Like the, the math is just as simple as it was before, where it's just increase in potential energy, or decrease in potential energy density, increase in pressure. But in this slide, we've seen multiple fluid systems, identified them here. We've related them with our Bernoulli equation or pieces of our Bernoulli equation. Um, and we've identified like the idea of a pressure gauge, um, how to measure the pressure in a pipe with the potential energy density. Um, yeah, something you might, you'll talk about this a little in DL, but this gives us a gauge pressure, not an absolute pressure. What that really just means is like, we're measuring the pressure with respect to the atmosphere. So I could either say, we have this much more pressure, this much more energy density than one ATM, or I could say this is my absolute pressure, like if you just measured it from a vacuum, uh, that it's a bit, um, yeah, I know, that, that's very specific, but it does come up in DL, so I just wanna mention it. This is a gauge pressure, easy way to remember it is, well, we're using a pressure gauge, so it gives us gauge pressure. Um, okay, kinetic energy density. So now we have pressure, potential energy density, um, and we see how those two can exchange back and forth. Now, kinetic energy density um, works in a very similar way, except instead of looking at the height of the fluid in a fluid system, um, we're looking at the area of the pipe. Why the area and not the speed, right? Normally, we think of kinetic energy as related to the speed, right? The faster something's moving, the higher the kinetic energy, but we cannot just observe the speed of fluid in a pipe, right? Even if the pipe was clear, if I presented you all with a pipe of water, with like a pipe with water flowing through it, there's nothing you could do to like, okay, it's moving at five meters per second. You can't really do that. But what you can do is say what the cross-sectional area of the pipe is. And you can very easily see when that increases or decreases. And like we found out before, using our conservation of current, that is AV or I, our current flow rate, is constant everywhere, A and V change proportionately to one another. When I increase the cross-sectional area of the pipe, the fluid slows down. When I decrease it, the fluid speeds up. So if I wanna know the difference in the speed of the fluid between one point of the pipe and another, I just need to look at the difference of the area between those two. In this case, A and B have the same cross-sectional area, and so the speed of the fluid has to be the same at both. And so there would be no change in kinetic energy density between these two. Um, but yeah, if the areas were different, which we'll see in a sec, the speed will be different. So area is our indicator for kinetic energy density. But when we use our equation for kinetic energy, so this should look pretty familiar to you. Kinetic energy is normally one half mv squared, right? But now we have one half rho v squared, rho meaning density instead of mass. So same steps that we use to get from potential energy to potential energy density, just divide by volume. And now also the delta here, um, yeah, is just the change in speed between two points. Like I said, we can't just observe these values of v of the speed, but what we can do is observe the area. So if we know the flow rate, then we can figure out what the speed is. Um, yeah, this is just rearrange this equation up here. I equals AV. So if I wanna solve for velocity, I just divide the flow rate by the area. So that instead of VB, this could be I over AB. And instead of VA, this could be I over VA. It's an important to note here that this is the difference between the squares of the velocity, right? It's VB squared minus VA squared. It's very common, and we all make this mistake sometimes, but to do VB minus VA 
and then squared. But that's incorrect. You have to do VB squared minus VA squared. Um, otherwise, you'd always get a positive answer. Like no matter what, you, when you square something, it's positive. Anyway, um, yeah, that's kinetic energy density. So now let's, let's give you an example um, to try to apply it. So now I've put up kind of a summary of everything we've done here. Now our Bernoulli equation has expanded by a term, right? We're building it up. Now we have our change in pressure. We have our change in potential energy density. And now we've added this change in kinetic energy density, another place where energy can go and where it can come from. And all of their changes have to sum to zero, right? They can all change values, but if you take away from one, it's got to go into another. This is the expression for change in kinetic energy density. This is the expression for change in potential. So now your question is, between the left and the right section of pipe, as water is flowing from left to right, what's the sign of the change in kinetic energy density? So I'm flowing from left to right. Area is definitely changing. Is kinetic energy increasing or decreasing? Kinetic energy density, sorry. Give you 30 more seconds with this one. All right. Pretty good agreement here, but not everyone. So let's take a look at it together. Does the fact that the height changes here affect the kinetic energy density? No. It'll come into play when we try to evaluate this whole equation, but I'm just asking, asking right now about this term, the delta Ke over volume, right? So can we just evaluate the speed? No, we have to look at, like I said, the cross-sectional area. What happens to the cross-sectional area as I go from right to left? It increases, right? The pipe gets wider, which tells us that the speed must decrease, right? I have a bunch of water flowing through here. We're all crowding through. Me and all the other water molecules are crowding through this narrow pipe, but then it expands into a much wider pipe with a bigger cross-sectional area, and so we can slow down. We still have to get the same amount of us through each point uh, in each amount of time so we can slow down because more of us can go the same, at the same time. Imagine like if you have, if we have to get all 150 of us through the doors in this classroom, if we can only get, and we have to do it in one minute, if we can only get one person through the door at a time, we're going to have to go pretty fast, right? We're going to have to run through to get all 150 people through single file. But if we knock down this back wall and now all 150 of you can walk side by side, it's much easier to get the same amount of people through in that one minute. So we can go super slow because we just need one row of us to pass through. Anyway, there's a bunch of ways you can think about that. But area increases, and so velocity must decrease, or speed, rather, must decrease. And so our change in kinetic energy is going to be negative. Kinetic energy density is negative. Um, so I'll summarize the answers on here in a sec. Yeah? It depends. So it's it's a delta. So you, if we if we want the change in kinetic energy density here, then I would have let, from left to right. Then I would do one half rho times v final squared. So that would be i over a two squared minus v initial squared, which is i over v one squared. Um, all right. So follow up to this. What's the sign of the potential energy density? I'll do this one really quick. What is the sign of the change in potential energy density going from left to right? Just 15 more seconds with this one. Okay, I'm going to stop there.
So for potential energy density, our indicator is height. What's happening to the height? It's increasing. And so our potential energy density is also increasing. So the sign of our potential energy density change is positive. So that being said, what is the sign of our change in pressure? So let's, we found the sign of both of these terms. If we plug them in to our, the equation we've built up so far, all the changes have to balance each other out. What is the change in pressure? Is it going to be positive, negative, zero? And I didn't open the poll on this one, but the answer is going to be that we can't tell. We need more information. We found that delta P over volume is positive, delta K over volume is negative, and so it's very possible that those two cancel each other out completely, in which case the change in pressure could be zero. Just the, all of the potential energy that we gained came from the loss in kinetic energy. But um, one of them could also be bigger. We, the potential energy change could be greater than the kinetic energy change, so then we're left with this net positive, so the pressure would have to drop. Or the kinetic energy drop could be greater, it could go all to potential, and it still has more to spend, so it goes to pressure. Um, so we need more info. Questions? Great question. Um, it doesn't really matter. So the height difference, um, you could call zero anywhere. I could call zero the ground, like this example does. I could call zero where H1 is now, and then H2 would just be you know, some small height above that, or I could even put zero way up here, and then they're both negative. The delta will always be the same. You know, it's like the difference between three and five versus the difference between zero and two, or the difference between you know, negative two and negative four. Um, so your, your absolute value doesn't matter really at all, at least for height. It just matters the change between those two points, which will be the same. Um, any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yes, if you, well, if you get the information that this is one steady state fluid system, or if, if you get information that indicates that, then yes, you would know that this Bernoulli equation, or that the balance like delta P plus delta P plus delta K E sum to zero is, is true. Um, yeah, so th this is true for any steady state, any single steady state fluid system. I say single because there will be examples where uh, like the one with the standpipe, you do have two separate fluid systems. So I couldn't just apply this equation to one point in that bottom pipe and one point in the standpipe because um, they're not part of the same system. I have to evaluate it where they meet. Okay, so looking at this equation, we have the different types of energy that can be transferred between them, like the different energy density systems that can transfer energy density between them and they all stay, the total stays constant throughout the circuit. So that's kind of like in 7a, we talked about like closed systems. Energy is conserved within closed systems, right? The energy, not, energy is not coming from anywhere, energy is not going anywhere. But what if we open up the system in a way? So we, we don't really use that terminology in this course as much, but there are ways that we can introduce energy to the circuit or dissipate it. So let's first talk about dissipation. So I'll introduce it as just another energy density system. We can have potential, we can have kinetic, we can also have thermal, right? And the way that happens in these is if there's this resistance in the pipe. So instead of like an ideal slick pipe that doesn't drag on the fluid at all, if we send fluid through a real pipe, there's gonna be some amount of resistance and it's gonna cause the fluid in the pipe to heat up a little bit. So one way we can think about that is by introducing this thermal energy density term. Right? And I just crossed out potential and kinetic here because in this example, I have a pipe that does not change its area and does not change its height, just for simplicity. So the only terms we have to worry about are delta P and delta E thermal over volume. So in this example, we have fluid flowing through a pipe that has resistance. So there's some pressure at P1, indicated by the height of the fluid in there. And then as we go from P1 to P2, there's resistance in the pipe that 
goes into thermal energy, and so our pressure has to decrease. We spend some of our pressure on thermal energy density. That's not necessarily the easiest way to think about it, though, in this case, because thermal energy doesn't like come back. With potential energy density, we could have a pipe go up, increase potential, and back down, decrease potential energy. And so we want to have this accounting sheet where it can go up and down, um, and that's why we have it as a delta. Same thing with kinetic. The pipe can get narrow and wide again and narrow. Um, so we also want that to be able to go up and down. Thermal energy density doesn't really work like that because once there's resistance and the fluid and the pipe heat up, there isn't really a way to turn that heat back into kinetic energy or back into potential or back into pressure. It just kind of dissipates and goes into the atmosphere. So instead of considering it as e-thermal over volume, as just like a quality of the fluid, we'll just think of it as dissipation, as energy leaving the system. So we'll put it on the other side. Instead of these three terms, potential, kinetic, and pressure adding to zero, they'll add to a negative, some loss. And that went to thermal energy. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, we, don't, we don't really worry about calling it a closed system or not because our equation is now taking it into account. But yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's not a closed system because the heat can leave it. Um, OK, so E thermal, what it, the way we calculate it is just the current times R, which is the value of resistance. Um, in a few weeks, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that, what increases resistance, what decreases it. But for now, it's, it'll just be given as a value. Like this is the resistance, multiply it by the current, and that's how much energy density I will have lost to thermal energy. And so like I said, it's easier to think of it as a loss rather than just a change in energy density system. So if we move that IR to the other side, where it used to be zero, now we have a minus IR. So now delta P, in this case there's no change in potential or kinetic, the change in pressure is just equal to this loss to thermal energy, the dissipation um, from the resistance of the pipe. Just like we can, yep. Yeah, exa that's exactly what it is, yeah. Just like we can lose energy or dissipate it into thermal, we can also add it in with a pump. Pumps are the easiest, well, conceptually, they can be the toughest piece of a circuit. Um, but mathematically, they're the easiest because it's just a number that it's given to you. How much energy density is this pump adding to the circuit? And that's it. I just tell you how much energy the pump adds, energy density the pump adds. Um, and just like E thermal, we turned into a subtraction, a dissipation of energy. E pump is just the opposite. It occurs, it increases. So now instead of all these energy density systems having to add up to zero, or the changes in each of them, sorry, having to add up to zero, now all the changes can add up to a positive number if a pump introduces more energy. So we still have this over idea of overall idea of conservation of energy. It can't be like created or destroyed, but if the system's not closed, we can leak it out into thermal or introduce it from a pump that's getting it from a wall outlet or something like that. So the energy's coming from somewhere. It's, so the, now this is the where I said the pump is can be the conceptually conceptually the trickiest part of this circuit. It's adding energy density. So what that means in the equation is that we just have some change in pressure, or if assuming all nothing else changes. So assuming the area doesn't change, assuming the height doesn't change, and assuming there's no dissipation. As the water flows through the pump, we just get an increase in energy density or an increase in pressure. And so if we put standpipes to the left and right of this pump here, you'd see some pressure on the left. And then once it went through the pump, the one on the right would be higher because we'd have a higher pressure. The pump introduced that energy density. So um, it's, yeah, so this is where the tricky part comes in. It does not increase the flow rate, the current, it does not increase the speed of the fluid flow either. It doesn't increase potential. It doesn't increase kinetic. It only increases energy density. So it's kind of an abstract way to think about it. 
Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, think of it, like in this example here, we know our indicator for kinetic energy density is area, cross-sectional area of the pipe, which clearly does not change here, right? The cross-sectional area here is the same as the cross-sectional area there. So, but there is an increase in energy density from the pump. That just the, that the area doesn't change tells us that the kinetic energy density doesn't change. So the pump does not change its kinetic energy density. It doesn't change the speed of the fluid flowing through the pipe. It just adds energy to those molecules. It's kind of abstract to think about. Maybe one way to think about it is even though they're all moving at the same speed to the left and the right of the pipe, if you measure like how hard the water is pushing on the pipe, on the outsides, the force per unit area, the like intuitive notion of pressure, how hard it's pushing on the pipe here is less than how hard it's pushing over here. So there's more pressure in it, yeah? Like, oh, I see what you're saying. So like when I was filling it and then once I stop that and once I spray it out, that is, yeah, well, it, it depends. So there's, there's a, that's a great question to think about, and one that I would love to put an example in a later lecture. The confusing, or the confounding parts there are, it depends on the pressure of the pump that you're using to fill it related to the air around it that you're emptying it out. So like the, the reservoir that you're emptying it is different. Um, and the other thing is that changes in time. Because when you have a pressurized container, you spray it, and then the pressure starts to decrease. So that's a great question, but we need a month or so <laughs> to, to really address it. Um, anyway, back to this example. So yeah, I, like for now, it is a little abstract. I think the best way to think about it is just like keep it that way. And don't think of, try, don't, don't work so hard to try to assign like how do I think about energy density? How do I think about pressure? Just think of it as accounting, right? I go through a circuit and I have some energy density that I can spend on potential and on kinetic. I can you know, spend it on potential. I can get it back from potential if I lower my height. If I go into a wider section of pipe, I decrease my kinetic energy. So that gives me some energy to spend somewhere. It's just an amount that has to go somewhere. And those things all add to zero. The changes all add to zero. Unless I have dissipation or a pump that introduces energy density, right? Those are like withdrawals or deposits from the account. Otherwise, everything has to stay self-contained. So we have some energy density, and then it can go, like the total is the same. It, the total change is zero. It can go between different energy density systems unless the total change is not zero. That can only happen if we open the system or add dissipation or add a pump. So there's a lot on this slide, but this is, this is gonna help us like, this is everything put together. I mean, this is it. This is the Bernoulli equation that we will be using for the next few weeks um, with, in all its glory, every single term. On the left-hand side, we have, like I said, this is, the, this is the accounting. This is the internal balance, the energy density that the fluid in the system has. It has some pressure, some potential energy density, and some kinetic energy density. If I take any two points in a single steady state fluid system, the change in those things has to balance out. If I increase potential and kinetic, my pressure will go down. And you know, we saw how those things will affect each other. Potential and kinetic both have indicators that tell us whether or not they're increasing or decreasing. We have the height for the potential and the cross-sectional area for the kinetic. And then pressure just kind of fills in the blanks. Right? We look at those indicators to see whether these two terms are going up and down, and then pressure will do whatever it takes to get that sum of changes to equal zero. But then on the other side, I was saying they all need to add to zero. That's true, unless some of it is, some more is introduced by a pump, in which case all those changes need to add up to just the net introduced by the pump, or if there's dissipation, in which case all those changes will add up to some negative value, which is just the amount of dissipation, and then all those things can occur together. I could have a pump that adds just as much energy density as the thermal energy dissipation takes away, right? Maybe I have some pump, have some pipe with resistance, but I don't wanna lose any energy density from the system. I wanna keep it constant, so I'll put a pump to make up for it. 
and then I can keep this total of change in pressure, change in potential, and change in kinetic to be constant throughout the circuit. So it'll take a bunch of examples, and you'll get plenty in DLs and FNTs to explore this. Oftentimes when you're using this equation, well, most times, you will not have all of these terms. Usually you'll have, like, be able to cross them out, right? If my pipe is completely horizontal, my delta PE is going to be zero. There's no change in height. If there's no pump, there's no E pump over volume, right? There's, so usually it's just a few of these things that are differing between two different points. Now, applying this is like the whole challenge. I mean, like once we, once we have this equation and understand what each pieces are, it's very important to define what it's describing. And the, those pieces are between two points in space, right? So the, the deltas in this equation signify that we always need to define when we're writing this equation, what is our start point and what is our end point? Then my delta P will be P final minus P initial. My delta PE over volume will be potential energy density final minus potential energy density initial, so on and so forth. So we need endpoints. The other thing, or sorry, contrary to that, on the right-hand side of the equation, a pump and resistance aren't things that we evaluate at endpoints, right? I have point A, point B, they each have these values of pressure, potential energy density, and kinetic energy density, but there's no, like, there's not like a pump at A and then a pump at B and we find the difference. The pump is somewhere in between. Same thing with the resistance. There isn't some delta that we calculate between A and B. We just introduce these terms if there is a pump or resistance or both between our start and our endpoints, and only then. And those, like, so those two you can think of the indicators as just like whether or not they're there. Does the problem say there is a pump? Does the problem say there is resistance? Does it say there is none? That's your indicator, <laughs> just whether it's there. Um, also, if those two things, the resistance and the pump, are not between your two endpoints, then they don't matter. We only care with our deltas about those two points, and with the non-delta quantities, we only care about what's in between them. So if I have point A and point B here, the way I've drawn it, the pump and the resistance are between them. So it does matter. If there's a pump, then there's going to be some net increase in energy density. If there's resistance, then the opposite. But if I took that pump and resistance and put it to the left of A, and I'm still calculating the change between A and B, then, I won't, then they won't be in the equation. Then there cannot be any net energy density change between A and B, because the pump and the resistance don't occur in between them. Yeah, sure, if we were calculating between like some other point way to the left and A, and those occurred between it, then we would factor them in. But you only take the pumps and resistances that are between the two points that you're determining. So it's super important when you're evaluating, and it makes it easier too, if you're like strict with this, that the only things you have to care about are the values at your two endpoints and what happens in between them, no matter how convoluted the rest of the circuit is, just those two points. Um, all terms here are energy densities, even though some have deltas, it's all joules per meter cubed or pascals or whatever units, that's something you'll get practice with. Um, and keep in mind that the deltas are change in position. This equation is constant in time because we have steady state fluid circuits. Um, so yeah, here's your intro to Bernoulli stuff. Your first week of DLs will be working with this and asking yourself some more specific questions, and then we'll apply it to more and more complicated systems. Um, a bunch, I'm sure you're aware, but a few DLs start today. The rest start next week, and I will see you next Friday. We do not have a quiz next week.